the pause from preparation for a christian life by soren kierkegaard published in 1850 translated by lee hollander in 1923 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the pause come hither unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and i shall give you rest pause now but what is there to give pause that which in the same instant makes all undergo an absolute change so that instead of seeing an immense throng of them that labor and are heavy laden following the invitation you will in the end behold the very opposite that is an immense throng of men who flee back shudderingly scrambling to get away trampling all down before them so that if one were to infer the sense of what had been said from the result it produced one would have to infer that the words had been procol o procol este profani rather than come hither that gives pause which is infinitely more important and infinitely more decisive the person of him who invites not in the sense that he is not the man to do what he has said or not god to keep what he has promised no in a very different sense pause is given by the fact that he who invites is and insists on being the definite historic person he was eighteen hundred years ago and that he as this definite person and living under the conditions then obtaining spoke these words of invitation he is not and does not wish to be one about whom one may simply know something from history for example world history history proper as against sacred history for from history one cannot learn anything about him the simple reason being that nothing can be known about him he does not wish to be judged in a human way from the results of his life that is he is and wishes to be a rock of offence and the object of faith to judge him after the consequences of his life is a blasphemy for being god his life and the very fact that he was then living and really did live is infinitely more important than all the consequences of it in history a who spoke these words of invitation he that invites who is he jesus christ which jesus christ he that sits in glory on the right side of his father no from his seat of glory he spoke not a single word therefore it is jesus christ in his lowliness and in the condition of lowliness who spoke these words is then jesus christ not the same yes verily he is to-day and was yesterday and eighteen hundred years ago the same who abased himself assuming the form of a servant the jesus christ who spake these words of invitation it is also he who hath said that he would return again in glory in his return in glory he is again the same jesus christ but this has not yet come to pass is he then not in glory now assuredly that the christian believes but it was in his lowly condition that he spoke these words he did not speak them from his glory and about his return in glory nothing can be known for this can in the strictest sense be a matter of belief only 
but a believer one cannot become except by having gone to him in his lowly condition to him the rock of offence and the object of faith in other shape he does not exist for only thus did he exist that he will return in glory is indeed expected but can be expected and believed only by him who believes and has believed in him as he was here on earth jesus christ is then the same yet lived he eighteen hundred years ago in debasement and is transfigured only at his return as yet he has not returned therefore he is still the one in lowly guise about whom we believe that he will return in glory whatever is said and taught every word he spoke becomes eo ipso untrue if we give it the appearance of having been spoken by christ in his glory nay he is silent it is the lowly christ who speaks the space of time between for example between his debasement and his return in glory which is at present about eighteen hundred years and will possibly become many times eighteen hundred this space of time or else what this space of time tries to make of christ the worldly information about him furnished by world history or church history as to who christ was as to who it was who really spoke these words all this does not concern us is neither here nor there but only serves to corrupt our conception of him and thereby renders untrue these words of invitation it is untruthful of me to impute to a person words which he never used but it is likewise untruthful and the words he used likewise become untruthful or it becomes untrue that he used them if i assign to him a nature essentially unlike the one he had when he did use them essentially unlike for an untruth concerning this or the other trifling circumstance will not make it untrue that he said them and therefore if it please god to walk on earth in such strict incognito as only one all-powerful can assume in guise impenetrable to all men if it please him and why he does it for what purpose that he knows best himself but whatever the reason and the purpose it is certain that the incognito is of essential significance i say if it please god to walk on earth in the guise of a servant and to judge from his appearance exactly like any other man if it please him to teach in this guise if now any one repeats his very words but gives the saying the appearance that it was god that spoke these words then it is untruthful for it is untrue that he spoke these words b can one from history learn to know anything about christ no and why not because one cannot know anything at all about christ for he is the paradox the object of faith and exists only for faith but all historic information is communication of knowledge therefore one cannot learn anything about christ from history for whether now one learn little or much about him it will not represent what he was in reality hence one learns something else about him than what is strictly true and therefore learns nothing about him or gets to know something wrong about him that is one is deceived history makes christ look different from what he looked in truth and thus one learns much from history about christ no not about christ because about him nothing can be known he can only be believed c can one prove from history that christ was god 
let me first ask another question is any more absurd contradiction thinkable than wishing to prove no matter for the present whether one wishes to do so from history or from whatever else in the wide world one wishes to prove it that a certain person is god to maintain that a certain person is god that is professes to be god is indeed a stumbling block in the purest sense but what is the nature of a stumbling block it is an assertion which is at variance with all human reason now think of proving that but to prove something is to render it reasonable and real is it possible then to render reasonable and real what is at variance with all reason scarcely unless one wishes to contradict oneself one can prove only that it is at variance with all reason the proofs for the divinity of christ given in scripture such as the miracles and his resurrection from the grave exist too only for faith that is they are no proofs for they are not meant to prove that all this agrees with reason but on the contrary are meant to prove that it is at variance with reason and therefore a matter of faith first then let us take up the proofs from history is it not eighteen hundred years ago now that christ lived is not his name proclaimed and reverenced throughout the world has not his teaching christianity changed the aspect of the world having victoriously affected all affairs has then history not sufficiently or more than sufficiently made good its claim as to who he was and that he was god no indeed history has by no means sufficiently or more than sufficiently made good its claim and in fact history cannot accomplish this in all eternity however as to the first part of the statement it is true enough that his name is proclaimed throughout the world as to whether it is reverenced that i do not presume to decide also it is true enough that christianity has transformed the aspect of the world having victoriously affected all affairs so victoriously indeed that everybody now claims to be a christian but what does this prove it proves at most that jesus christ was a great man the greatest perhaps who ever lived but that he was god stop now that conclusion shall with god's help fall to the ground now if one intends to introduce this conclusion by assuming that jesus christ was a man and then considers the eighteen hundred years of history namely the consequences of his life one may indeed conclude with a constantly rising superlative he was great greater the greatest extraordinarily and astonishingly the greatest man who ever lived if one begins on the other hand with the assumption of faith that he was god one has by so doing stricken out and cancelled the eighteen hundred years as not making the slightest difference one way or the other because the certainty of faith is on an infinitely higher plane and one course or the other one must take but we shall arrive at sensible conclusions only if we take the latter if one takes the former course one will find it impossible unless by committing the logical error of passing over into a different category one will find it impossible in the conclusion suddenly to arrive at the new category god that is one cannot make the consequence or consequences of a man's life suddenly prove at a certain point in the argument that this man was god 
if such a procedure were correct one ought to be able to answer satisfactorily a question like this what must the consequence be how great the effects how many centuries must elapse in order to infer from the consequences of a man's life for such was the assumption that he was god or whether it is really the case that in the year three hundred christ had not yet been entirely proved to be god though certainly the most extraordinarily astonishingly greatest man who had ever lived but that a few more centuries would be necessary to prove that he was god in that case we would be obliged to infer that people in the fourth century did not look upon christ as god and still less they who lived in the first century whereas the certainty that he was god would grow with every century also that in our century this certainty would be greater than it had ever been a certainty in comparison with which the first centuries hardly so much as glimpsed his divinity you may answer this question or not it does not matter in general is it at all possible by the consideration of the gradually unfolding consequences of something to arrive at a conclusion different in quality from what we started with is it not sheer insanity providing man is sane to let one's judgment become so altogether confused as to land in the wrong category and if one begins with such a mistake then how will one be able at any subsequent point to infer from the consequences of something that one has to deal with an altogether different in fact infinitely different category a footprint certainly is the consequence of some creature having made it now i may mistake the track for that of let us say a bird whereas by nearer inspection and by following it for some distance i may make sure that it was made by some other animal very good but there was no infinite difference in quality between my first assumption and my latter conclusion but can i on further consideration and following the track still further arrive at the conclusion therefore it was a spirit a spirit that leaves no tracks precisely the same holds true of the argument that from the consequences of a human life for that was the assumption we may infer that therefore it was god is god then so like man is there so little difference between the two that while in possession of my right senses i may begin with the assumption that christ was human and for that matter has not christ himself affirmed that he was god on the other hand if god and man resemble each other so closely and are related to each other in such a degree that is essentially belong to the same category of beings then the conclusion therefore he was god is nevertheless just humbug because if that is all there is to being god then god does not exist at all but if god does exist and therefore belongs to a category infinitely different from man why then neither i nor anyone else can start with the assumption that christ was human and end with the conclusion that therefore he was god any one with a bit of logical sense will easily recognize that the whole question about the consequences of christ's life on earth is incommensurable with the decision that he is god in fact this decision is to be made on an altogether different plane man must decide for himself whether he will believe christ to be what he himself affirmed he was that is god or whether he will not believe so what has been said mind you providing one will take the time to understand it 
is sufficient to make a logical mind stop drawing any inferences from the consequences of christ's life that therefore he was god but faith in its own right protests against every attempt to approach jesus christ by the help of historical information about the consequences of his life faith contends that this whole attempt is blasphemous faith contends that the only proof left unimpaired by unbelief when it did away with all the other proofs of the truth of christianity the proof which indeed this is complicated business i say which unbelief invented in order to prove the truth of christianity the proof about which so excessively much ado has been made in christendom the proof of eighteen hundred years as to this faith contends that it is blasphemy with regard to a man and it is true that the consequences of his life are more important than his life if one then in order to find out who christ was and in order to find out by some inference considers the consequences of his life why then one changes him into a man by this very act a man who like other men is to pass his examination in history and history is in this case as mediocre an examiner as any half-baked teacher in latin but strange by the help of history that is by considering the consequences of his life one wishes to arrive at the conclusion that therefore therefore he was god and faith makes the exact opposite contention that he who even begins with this syllogism is guilty of blasphemy nor does the blasphemy consist in assuming hypothetically that christ was a man no the blasphemy consists in the thought which lies at the bottom of the whole business the thought without which one would never start it and of whose validity one is fully and firmly assured that it will hold also with regard to christ the thought that the consequences of his life are more important than his life in other words that he was a man the hypothesis is let us assume that christ was a man but at bottom of this hypothesis which is not blasphemy as yet there lies the assumption that the consequences of a man's life being more important than his life this will hold true also of christ unless this is assumed one must admit that one's whole argument is absurd must admit it before beginning so why begin at all but once it is assumed and the argument is started we have the blasphemy and the more one becomes absorbed in the consequences of christ's life with the aim of being able to make sure whether or no he was god the more blasphemous is one's conduct and it remains blasphemous so long as this consideration is persisted in curious coincidence one tries to make it appear that providing one but thoroughly considers the consequences of christ's life this therefore will surely be arrived at and faith condemns the very beginning of this attempt as blasphemy and hence the continuance in it as a worse blasphemy history says faith has nothing to do with christ with regard to him we have only sacred history which is different in kind from general history sacred history which tells of his life and career when in abasement and tells also that he affirmed himself to be god he is the paradox which history never will be able to digest or convert into a general syllogism he is in his debasement the same as he is in his exaltation but the eighteen hundred years 
or let it be eighteen thousand years have nothing whatever to do with this the brilliant consequences in the history of the world which are sufficient almost to convince even a professor of history that he was god these brilliant consequences surely do not represent his return in glory forsooth in that case it were imagined rather meanly the same thing over again christ is thought to be a man whose return in glory can be and can become nothing else than the consequences of his life in history whereas christ's return in glory is something absolutely different and a matter of faith he abased himself and was swathed in rags he will return in glory but the brilliant consequences in history especially when examined a little more closely are too shabby a glory at any rate a glory of altogether incongruous nature of which faith therefore never speaks when speaking about his glory history is a very respectable science indeed only it must not become so conceited as to take upon itself what the father will do and clothe christ in his glory dressing him up with the brilliant garments of the consequences of his life as if that constituted his return that he was god in his debasement and that he will return in glory all this is far beyond the comprehension of history nor can all this be got from history excepting by an incomparable lack of logic and however incomparable one's view of history may be otherwise how strange then that one ever wished to use history in order to prove christ divine end of the pause from preparation for a christian life by soren kierkegaard published in 1850